This is the center for religion and the city. The next stop is Contagion, Religion and Cities. Welcome to the fourth episode of the Contagion, Religion and Cities podcast. We are meeting today to discuss the different challenges we're facing in the classroom as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and the varying strategies and solutions we've developed to redress these challenges. Harold Morales, the director of the Center for the Study of Religion in the City, is here today, as well as Christina Rossetti, Kayla Wheeler, Faye Wing, and co-hosts Amanda Ferliasse and Cher Afghan Turi. Harold will get us started with discussion today. What I've been doing this semester um, in terms of teaching, so um, I'm teaching both a world religions class and a religion and museums class, and both of them have, have uh, focused in on the CSRC's work. Um, or drawn on it. Um, and technically, one of the things that I've been doing in terms of teaching remotely has been to set up appointment slots so that students can, um, can uh, uh, sign up for one of those um, slots. And then I have small group discussions with five to 10 students. Uh, and so I break that up over the course of three weeks uh, to, to make it a little bit easier on me. Um, but Several of those have been really, really fruitful, have been um, good experiences. Uh, one of the last ones I had yesterday was an amazing, it was a, like 10 people on there. Um, and basically I, I have some framing questions and I give like a five minute introduction to what's going on. And then I ask the students to take over. And then I, I, I tell them, right? I emphasize that um, if they don't participate then they're, they won't get um, marked as, as being present. Uh, in, in any case, it worked out really well, um, but it kind of depends just like a, a classroom setting uh, on the individuals that are present. Um, but this format, it doesn't matter if they're showing their screens or not, because it's more of a small group discussion through audio. Um, and so that's the, the primary sort of um, way through which I, I try to have those small group discussions and that's been working well. Um, I wonder like if other people want to say a little bit about more of the technical end of what they're doing. I know Cher's doing um, some like podcasting for for conveying his lectures or putting his lecture work out there. Sure, yeah. So Amanda and I are basically in the same house and uh, our syllabi are quite similar. So what we do is we have very similar assigned reading. So we'll just like turn on Zoom, sit in a different part of the house and act like pretend like we're somewhere else. And then we'll just like run up, like, you know, just do an hour long, hour and a half max, just go with the reading. And uh, it's just a good way to just, it, it's much more, it's better than a lecture because he'll say something and I'll, you know, pick up something from what she said. I'll be like, oh yeah, page 60, look, let's go through this paragraph. And then I'll ask her a question. What do you think about this? Why, you know, how can you remember and dream or something like that? And she'll say something. And then usually I have a, some kind of PowerPoint presentation accompanying us. And, you know, just like next thing you know, like you spend an hour and it's like, oh, that's pretty good. So let me just put that, you know, YouTube link, make it a YouTube, make a module, put it on Canvas module, the link. So that's sort of how I do my lectures. Mm -hmm. Do you include the video or it's just the audio? So we include the video. Yeah. So yeah. A lot of body language going in there. Yeah, mm -hmm. I yeah. suppose. Yeah. Yeah. There was a lot of um, debate at my university because, uh, over the idea of passive listening. I don't know if you guys have, you know, like, cause there's the idea of like, okay, should we use technology to make it super interactive and like touch and get involved? Or is there like um, a value to like passive listening and just putting your voice kind of more like a podcast format? And, and so that the students, cause I've, I, I see it both ways, you know, I, I kind of see the debate go both ways. And I'm kind of interested what other people think. Um, after reading some of the literature on it. I do think that younger people are really into passive listening. Like they'll put their headphones on and they'll walk. So, so I'm doing synchronous by the way, but um, so I can't do this. So I, I will, I'm trying to do a little bit of this, but like synchronous style. But a lot of students while I'm doing the course are working or like working out or like walking and they had the headphones on and um, or they're doing something while they're listening. So I have a student who's taking care of her child. She's in the background, you know, stuff like that where they, they can't, some people can't, don't have the ability to like actively participate. And some people really actually enjoy or prefer the idea of kind of like a passive listening 
where they're just listening along like a podcast. I don't know what anybody else thinks. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. I, I really like listening to audiobooks or podcasts mm -hmm. while doing something else, going on a walk, working on a puzzle or something like that. So does mm -hmm. to kind of keep active and makes it a little bit easier for me. Um, I guess, uh, Kayla and Christine, I wonder if, if um, you could say a little bit about the technical aspect of how you're teaching nowadays. So I am teaching two classes completely synchronously. Um, and it's been interesting. I'm like the early afternoon classes. So right when students are trying to get lunch and I'm usually their second class. So I found that doing a whole bunch of different things every day does not really work for them. So just keeping it simple so they can talk while they're eating or cooking or driving to work. So usually we, I just lecture for maybe five or 10 minutes, then we break out um, into the different breakout rooms and I have them use social media. So I taught a class on intersectionality on Tuesday and I made my students find memes that best explain what intersectionality was. Today, we talked about um, hip hop feminism, using the city girls and Megan the Stallion as examples of embracing disrespectability politics. So we each made in groups our own disrespectability politics mixtapes. And they seem to like doing that kind of stuff where they can quickly engage online and then get back to their discussions. And for me, the majority of my students are black and many of them have access issues. So the more devices I use, the more websites I use, the less accessible my material is for my students. I have a number of students who are getting online using cell phones and tablets. They don't have access to laptops because the university is basically closed down. So keeping it simple. Yeah. Yeah, I'm doing much of the same with trying to keep it simple, especially for a lot of my students have reached out that they're, you know, not in the country or they're taking on additional jobs or they're now, you know, watching children at home. Um, and so I did adopt, I'm teaching two classes that are very different from one another. I'm teaching a class at a community college that is 35 students. Um, and so that has been more discussion based, based on the students wanting that interaction and wanting to be able to have conversations. Um, but the other class I'm teaching is 180 students on a Zoom call. Um, and so there's really, it's very hard to have discussion, but those students being in the early afternoon, um, like Kayla mentioned, wanting to you know get lunch and they're taking care of children and they're doing so much. Um, I have adopted more of an approach of just, just listen to what's happening, put on headphones, do what you, go, do what you can do. Um, and kind of making it more conversational. And we'll talk more about, you know, when we talk about what we're actually doing, but I'm teaching death right now. And <laughs> particularly for a class teaching death, when we're surrounded by mass death and violence against the black folks, like, you know, there's, there's a lot to unpack there on how to talk about those things. So I have very much adopted a more kind of casual approach, especially to that class. Yeah, so I think, I guess that that's a good segue into um, another discussion of, about content, right? So what are we, um, have you changed up the courses, the way that we do them? Um, are we bringing in the pandemic into our classes? Um, are we bringing in the, um, the protests and Black Lives Matter movement um, into the courses? What, um, how are we dealing with the time uh, beyond just the, the modalities? Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I was. I was gonna say yeah, because it's something I struggled with personally. I mean, I'm teaching a, three courses, and I'll be teaching four next term, so we'll see. <laughs> so, but um, I'm, I'm teaching a health and healing course right now. So, and at first, I thought about talking about like COVID and stuff, but actually, a lot of the students, at least in this class, maybe it's different, didn't want to. Just kind of had this like, God, I'm so like sick of it kind of stuff. <laughs> A little bit which they almost wanted an escape and so I was like okay cool you know we'll talk about native it's Native American and African so it, you know I was like okay sure yeah we you know they were really interested in it so I, I um, it was almost like it, it was too much and they wanted to just escape and go into another world or like have an alternative um, you know because we will be talking about issues like pandemics and stuff but they didn't really want to relate to COVID-19 
And yeah, some of my other classes, um, it, on my campus too, we've had a, a lot of issues because the school is historically predominantly um, had a lot of white students and now it's like, like shifted and extremely more diverse and we've had a lot of issues on campus and stuff. So some of the students, I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I try to engage, but there's almost like they have a trauma that, <laughs> that it, it's like a traumatic and they're experiencing these things because um, Hamlin's right in the middle of the Twin Cities and most of the kids are from Minneapolis or St. Paul, which, and we were all, I myself was a part of those, the, the rioting itself, saw it, was it immersed in it. Um, as were most of the students, and a lot of them have this um, like really trauma from being there witnessing it. And so I don't know how to quite grapple with it. So yeah, it'd be great talking with other people about that. To be honest, I am so exhausted. So I'm only teaching two classes this semester, which is a godsend. One is Intro to African American Studies, and the other one is Race in the Digital Age. And my race in a digital age is like 95% white and African-American studies is 90% black. And so it, for me, it kind of feels like the race and digital age students, they're more open to talking about Black Lives Matter or like they're less exhausted about it because it's that thing over there. Um, and I don't have that much on the syllabus. Like we have a, it's a global class. So we talk about like, I have, a bit about NSARS that we did um, on Tuesday. We talked about roads must fall. So we talk about anti-Black racism and just like anti-indigeneity and how activists use the internet to challenge that. But I've noticed that they're like interested in learning like how do I not be racist? How do I help Black people? Whereas in my intro to Black African American studies, like my students are coming back from organizing protests our campus is only like a few hours away from Louisville and many of my students were involved with the protest to fight for justice for Breonna Taylor. So they're exhausted, but because they're black and I'm black, they kind of like look to me for like, I don't know if it's necessarily hope, but like an idea of what the future is going to be like, because I'm not that much older, but a bit older than them. And so it's been hard. Like they want to talk about certain things, but I don't really have it in me to go through it over and over and over again. So finding that balance. Um, what I've been doing, and I put this in my syllabus so people knew it would happen, is that I've been adding readings or switching things out or having recommended readings. So when Megan the Stallion put out her op-ed early in the week, I included that for today's class since we were talking about hip hop feminism and it was something that they appreciated. So kind of finding that like balance between my own like mental wellness and giving them a space to like vent and be themselves. And I honestly, I haven't touched the pandemic at all because we're in a hot spot. We keep being in a hot spot. Um, Ohioans are book wild. I love my state, but like <laughs> no one is taking it Like the most I talk about the pandemic is please wear your mask and please stop going to parties. <laughs> yeah. I think, um, I wonder if, if that's a similar situation for you, Christina, in terms of your death class. Do you feel like the students are kind of um, exhausted in terms of dealing with, with death and dying um, in the current age? Or is there like rule more, is there a desire for students to like make the course a space for having some discussions around that? Yeah, um, I mean, even before the course started, right, I had already gotten so many emails of students who can't come back to the U.S. currently because we are in a moment of mass death of students who have lost loved ones, um, of students who are sick and afraid of dying. And then now, you know, Monday rolls around and I say, welcome to death. So that, like, the whole kind of thing is a lot um, to handle. Um, and it's, you know, I've taught this class before and I, I love it. I love the content of it. I love the material. Um, we do a large section on mourning. And one of the interesting things that came up is usually when I've taught this class, I do a section on death in American religious history and how a lot of how we mourn and talk about death and dying comes from the religious history of the U.S. Um, and usually students, that's what students are excited to get to. And for the first time, looking at the chat in the Zoom call, students were just like, are we going to talk about mourning? America's really bad at mourning. We're really bad at talking about mass death. Are we going to have these conversations? 
students, it, yes, they wanted to learn, you know, how does Buddhism understand the afterlife? Like, yes, that's always there. But for the first time teaching this class, there was such a desire to say, are we going to talk about why we're so bad at dealing with death? Um, and that was, you know, eye-opening that students want these, want to talk about this. Um, unlike before I did, unfortunately cut a lot of my units short so that I could put a unit on the end about BLM. Um, I do have students who experience anti-Black racism daily. Um, and then I did put a whole section on the pandemic um, and kind of comparatively looking at how religions dealt with plague and how religions dealt with AIDS. Um, so that students could see that, you know, we're, we're replaying the same conversations that we've been playing out for a long time. And yes, you think that we're having a hard time mourning. Welcome. You know, this <laughs> is not, we've struggled to grapple with death for a long time. So uh, yeah, students are really wanting, wanting this. I'm glad, you know, it's not a, a standardly taught course in the department. And so I'm, I'm very glad that it was taught now. Um, you know, I wish it was smaller classes so we could have better conversations. 180 grappling with death is a lot. So, but yeah, we've, we've been, there's definitely a desire to talk about the nature of mourning. Yes. So I'm, I'm doing two classes and one of them, the religion and museums class is just taking all of the materials that we've collected the, over the summer, this, the center. So all the oral histories that um, Kayla helped to put together um, some of the photographs, some of the images, and, and just made them available to the students. Um, and we learned about uh, the history of museums, uh, the role of colonialism and, and collections and um, interpretations. And so we look at all these different positions and then they develop their own proposals and digital mock-up using the uh, art steps that Amanda and Cher um, uh, shared with the group. Um, so they, you, they create this digital mock-up um, and what they're supposed to be doing is telling the story of how race, um, the pandemic, and, um, and religion intersect. So they draw on all these materials to tell a, a story of the intersection between those three phenomena. Um, and, and I leave it up to them what, how they focus, what kinds of stories they tell. Uh, and that's been, that's been exciting. I've got a lot of positive feedback. Um, I have had a couple of students who turned in um, a digital mock-up without a write-up saying that it, it was uh, really raw for them and they didn't want to write about it, but they did enjoy the opportunity or found it helpful to, to be able to put pieces together to tell a story. Um, so there's, there's some students who do find it difficult. And then we, like, of course, I'll we'll work with them to, to come up with alternatives. My other course is a world religions class that I always work with um, three different organizations that come in um, with the to help the students connect with what's going on in the city. Uh, and that's Jews United for Justice um, and the Black Church Food Security Network. And both of them have been centering the pandemic. So it's more of just kind of like, I, I'm doing what I always do in terms of working with these three organizations. Um, and because their work is focused on, um, so like Jews United for Justice, they're currently working on um, introducing a bill and trying to find funding for um, uh, right to counsel for renters. Um, and so people are thinking about the, uh, the housing um, injustices that are about to like start becoming an, a, a really um, prominent issue for a lot of folks. Uh, and then also with Heber Brown in terms of the, the role that the uh, black church is playing in Baltimore in addressing food apartheid, um, food insecurity. Um, so again, it just kind of like organically happens. And the last one is the uh, Institute for Islamic, um, Christian and Jewish Studies. And they're doing a series of interreligious dialogues on water justice in the city um, and the way that it's connected to both just like life and um, hygiene and being able to wash your hands um, and, and, and to use soap and things like that. And the way in which water sometimes gets used in the city to evict people from their houses um, when they don't pay their bills. And so they have all these different conversations. Um, I wonder, Cher, if you could say a little bit, uh, because Cher is helping to lead those conversations, um, both on the like technical end, because this, this is like 150 people also that join in these community dialogues. Usually they're like situated within particular places in the city so that the community becomes more familiar with these spaces, but now it's happening 
digitally and it's kind of Zoom breakout rooms with some prep materials beforehand? Sure, so yeah, I'm one of the fellows. So basically what they do is they have two um, halves uh, over a span of a year. So first half, they just have the fellows. We go over specific passages in uh, uh, scripture from Christian, Jewish, and Muslim traditions and all ref with some kind then like you know talk about read it together then find common themes or like some themes about water justice city uh, and uh, then we just talk about it and uh, one of the individuals from the icj uh, the, the 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 institute one of, one of them is responsible for giving a about a half an hour presentation on the tradition itself second half started last week where the fellows are paired up uh, to facilitate such conversations with just community members. I don't know how they did the advertisement. I mean, I just sent it to my mom and said, if you know anybody wants to do it, it's free. You just register online. But uh, they got a lot of people. Uh, my group, we have, I think, about eight folks. Um, adults, well-educated from all kinds of interesting backgrounds, pastors, and, uh, you know, m most of the individuals, even the fellows, they're either educators or, you know, therapists, uh, some kind of community leader. Um, and, uh, yeah, COVID came up, actually. One of the chaps, poor guy, you know, he contracted COVID, as you said, like a few months ago, and he, you know, he had an oxygen tank. And uh, it became very, it was interesting. You know, this first meeting, we were just introducing each other and uh, the the prop given to us was to ask everyone uh, share a sacred story um, and then we all went around and shared a story and uh, it worked in a weird in a weird way one guy was sitting in his car he was dropping off his daughter to pick up something so he was talking about a sacred story in his passenger seat and everybody else was sitting in their homes but uh it worked well. I mean, I just kind of like, like a teacher, I just kind of like, you know, listen in, uh, pick up some themes from people's stories. One guy talked about, a, you know, how a bell is really sacred. He grew up in a Christian tradition, transition to like some, uh, some kind of a meditation, a yoga, uh, some uh, Zen meditation and the bell ringing is the common theme. So, you know, it was interesting. I said, yeah, sounds is key. That's important. And it, at the end, people were like pretty emotional. They were like, you know, I really didn't know what to expect from this, but I'm so excited to meet again next two weeks from now. It had an effect even over Zoom. Uh, so yeah, it was interesting. It's a, it's they they've done a, they've done a good job to do doing over Zoom. We like break out into these like sessions, and I mean they got a lot. I mean we're like the fellows. We, I think we're like thirty of us at least. So the last one we had with all these other people, I mean it was more than a hundred people on Zoom. I don't know how they did it, but it was pretty. It was well done. It worked. Mm -hmm. uh, Faye, I see that you're you're on here as well. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit. You're both student, right? Are you taking classes right now? And also you're a fellow with the IJB as well? Okay, actually I am not taking classes now. I am, okay. I have completed all of my studies. I'm just um, Congrats. to graduate. All right. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> yeah. And so um, I am one of the student fellows and Last week was quite interesting, wasn't it, Cher? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it was. I say that because um, I was trying to take um, one of the leadership roles, you know, uh, leading the conversation. But last week, like Cher said, it was um, basically a time, more like a meet and greet time where we introduced ourselves to one another. Um, this week coming in, uh, not this week, on, I think on the 22nd is when we have our next meeting. Uh, we will be discussing the Jewish traditions. What I found interesting, and I can't wait to, to really uh, have this dialogue with everybody, was uh, one of the gentlemen um, stated that he didn't see how uh, water justice uh, was related to religion, so or faith, and so I, I, I'm. Uh, I think that's going to be a very interesting discussion. Um, as a student, I felt a little bit intimidated because uh, our group, in our group, we didn't have 
any Morgan students. And the, the other thing is that we had mostly um, mature men. I think there was one other uh, woman other than the, um, other than Fatima. So um, I'm looking forward to this and I'm looking forward to yeah, there's interesting gender dynamics. Um, among the fellows, I think there are three guys and all women, and then amongst this group is all men and one girl. Yes, and they're, and they're all look, they're all older men. So I think it's going to be really interesting. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I, it's it's uh for me it's been interesting, right? Because um, work, working with students, they mostly have their cameras off. Um, and when they do pop them on, they like they like they'll turn them off for a, a, like a few moments just to say something and then turn it off again. You want to uh, see me? <laughs> oh no, no. <laughs> <laughs> that's not. <laughs> but in terms of like age, it's it's really difficult for me to even you know tell what what's going on in terms of of uh, the the student population that I'm working with. Um, and sometimes it comes up like, well, people will will bring up stories from such and such a an year, and I'm just like, oh, okay. So it kind of helps me to navigate. But yeah, it, it's an interesting dynamic um, having classes in all like small group discussions where mostly it's just um, audio. Okay. Yeah, I think I I also like the format that the um, the IJB is taking, where they pre-record these videos, and so the Jewish scholar Ben Sachs. Um, I was looking at the video earlier today, starts mm -hmm. out by saying, you know, in the, in the creation story, in the beginning, there was water. And so that's to say that water was not created. Water was already there within the Jewish um, framing. Uh, and, and then that leads into all kinds of discussions about um, the knowledge of God, like what can be said and what cannot be said, um, mm -hmm. again, from his Jewish perspective. Um, and and then that also leads to the knowledge of water in terms and power of what can be um, said and not said about it since it was already there, um, not created by God. It was something that God works with, but not um, instantiated by God. Uh, and in particular, just for me, was the conclusion that um, he made in terms of justice, that justice in a city like Baltimore can't can't be should not be articulated. That you can point out what injustices are, but um, you can't really come up with a vision of justice because that's always going to be that moment's vision of justice that could be altered, fluid, changing um, in the future. So I'm, I'm really excited about the next, um, the next set of conversations as well. I think we had like 30 students join. Uh, it's the largest um, group of Morgan students that have ever gone. And I think that's in part because, um, so I'm sorry that you didn't have any in your group, Faye, but um, I think it's in part the large um, student population is in part because of the, the format. Um, and so traveling to actual places in the city was prohibitive for a lot mm -hmm. of students and being able to just go um, virtually has, has been accessible. So I'm still talking with um, with the ICGS about future iterations, whether or not we, we include a virtual component as well. Um, I think one of the things that they were um, impressed with was how open and honest the Morgan students were. And we think that maybe, you know, the students were more comfortable by not uh, showing themselves, yeah. you know, yeah, not being on video and they were able to share even more. Mm. Yeah. yeah, that was something that I think it carries over uh, is the idea for, especially like younger people, I guess, I don't know, I'm a younger person, maybe, I don't know, <laughs> I'm on the border now, I'm one of those old millennials, but uh, yeah, it seems like the virtual is like for, for maybe like me as a millennial, I see the virtual as like not to share my privacy, I, I kind of have borders and walls up, but, but they seem to not necessarily have those walls, they seem to be more comfortable in virtual spaces. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I kind of like having my video off. I think I wish one people, one thing that people would keep in mind was like diversity of experiences. So like I am Muslim and I dress modestly. I don't wear a hijab, but like what I wear inside my house is very different than what I wear out in public. So like you would never see me in shorts or anything super revealing. 
but I do that in my house all the time. But now since I like constantly have to be on Zoom and everybody expects me to have my camera on, like I have to have a whole new wardrobe just for Zooming. And like, this is my fourth meeting of the day and I have one right after this. And so I've had to have uncomfortable clothes on all day. <laughs> if I had like, my screen off, I would be chilling in bed right now. Yeah. <laughs> being yeah. in jammies all day. <laughs> I think that's, yeah, that's, that's another really important aspect of, of teaching right now. Um, just like the, the, dom the domestic space, the rituals that we ourselves take up in terms of, of doing the class, um, both in terms of like the costumes we've done, <laughs> the, um, but also like the, um, the kinds of like language that we choose to Right, because my kids will pop in every now and then into the office and all of a sudden I'm, I'm speaking as dad um, and, and like focus on your work, right? Get back to school um, and then having to switch the kinds of language and tones that I use in terms that I usually take up. But yeah, I think that the, the kind of like the domestic space is for sure changing. Um, I don't know if other people have anything to add on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in many ways, um, Cher and I were actually writing a chapter about this is the, this private public. Um, it's, it's in a strange place because you are in a public, Zoom is a public space, and yet oftentimes you Zoom within a private space, like Kayla, you were talking about, right, in your home, and yet Zoom is a public square kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so like, it, it's a strange um, situation that I don't think a lot of us have we're, it's 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 going to require redefining and changing space totally. Like especially thinking about the classroom, thinking about how universities design space, things like that. I I, I like looking at Cher's camera because he's like usually walking around outside. <laughs> 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 yeah. Um, but I wonder how this changes also our sense of the city of what the city is, mm. right? Mm. So like. Um, for, for a lot of the students, um, being being at Morgan means being in Baltimore. That's no longer the case, right? So they're mm -hmm. at, at Morgan, but they're located in a bunch of different places. And this is um, the same situation for a lot of us. Mm -hmm. um, but mm -hmm. what what does it mean to to be in a city, to teach about the city when, when these um, both borders between private and public, but also within and outside of a city or urban context change as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this has been, I, this is a question that I have too, just about like too, um, with social media use and things like that. Um, specifically this idea that the city is per, like pervading or in, like coming into the suburban space. Um, like, so I'm on an outskirt of Chicago in a suburb, Southwest suburb, but um, all these suburban people started sharing photos and stuff of parties that were happening in Inglewood and on the Southwest side. I don't know if you've heard of some of this. And then the mayor of Chicago had to come out and be like, don't have parties, you know, this kind of stuff. But it was like a private party on the Southwest side of Chicago was suddenly being shared by like suburban people and being like part of this, like, like this, this Chicago was expanding. There's this notion that social media can almost, I, I don't know, like, expand the limits and boundaries of what we consider a city. Yeah. That's an interesting idea. Yeah, and I, and I think in many ways too, it raises questions and I think, Kayla, when you're talking about perspectives and experiences, I think one of the questions I have is for um, specifically like minority communities in these, in these virtual spaces. Um, you know, because you see a lot right now with like Jewish communities and Williamsburg, Brooklyn right now is in a fight with <laughs> the mayor de Blasio. Um, these ethnic, these small ethnic enclaves historically, right, like Williamsburg or Inglewood, right, it, you know, is it just a coincidence that we, all of our attention is focusing on these neighborhoods which have been historically kind of separated from you know predominantly white wealthy areas um because that's that's one thing that i've been noticing on social media too is like this idea of what's like the spatial dynamics of how cities are even arranged around neighborhoods and things like that and it seems like um 
minority communities or people who live in communities that have been historically separated from other communities, those separations are coming undone in certain ways. And, and, and how we're working on like, it's almost like, like, for example, when I said that story about Englewood, sorry to go on this long time, but it was being in Chicago, it was just kind of um, interesting how this happened, is I had a lot of friends sharing this party, for example, who lived in like Naperville out in the Southwest suburbs with me, which is historically white, wealthy area. And they would, they were sharing it on their Instagram. And I was like, why do you care? You know, it's not your neighborhood. And she, and one of my friends was, well, well it will have implications on me. Um, and, and this idea, and historically she, one of my friends who lives on this outskirt on the Southwest suburb, she's never been to Englewood in her life before physically been there yet suddenly within this virtual space she cares a lot about what's happening in this space so i don't know i was just thinking about these larger questions and how they'll impact education and universities so i i was thinking right so in terms of the the permeation of the city um, and the way in which it kind of like mm -hmm. expands um, virtually um, and then like its connection to pedagogy. So I know mm -hmm. Cher has done um, virtual tours before for your, like in your classroom. And I know Kayla has also done um, a virtual tour for pedagogical and, and, um, and other um, uh, reasons, right? So I wonder if both of you could tell, say a little bit about the, the ways in which you use virtual tours and maybe some of the limitations oh, yeah. of those. Sure, I can go first. I did the tour, I received I forgot her name, but I think she was or is a PhD student at UNC and she gave a tour of Harlem and she took us around um, the NOI temple and then uh, the uh, headquarters of the 5%, 5% nation of gods on earth. And then we walked towards the um, Senegalese. Um, uh, the, the, there's one road where they had historically had this uh, parade for a Anti post anti colonialist uh, Senegalese preacher, uh, and then just some other uh, small mosques where you know with very rich history of NOI. I took pictures and I made a Google map uh, basically, and I kind of like uh, you know created this Google Earth tour. I started doing uh, teaching that at Florida State, and either it's just I'm bad with Google Earth, I stress out when I'm teaching <laughs> for some reason. Whenever I would like try to like move the thing and like move the arrows, I'd like take me to a different street and I stress. I was like, which street am I? Am I on, am I on Arthur <laughs> Boulevard? Am I? And then I was just like, I right, dang it, let me zoom out again. It just wouldn't go as smoothly as I wanted to. Uh, I don't know what the students' reception was. I honestly think like, I it just almost felt like it it did not go the way I thought. I thought I'm transforming the classroom into Harlem and it didn't transform. <laughs> I think it was still very much Tallahassee. I just like, I don't know if it was as good as I thought it would, it would be. So I kept it. I don't know if I did it with my Morgan students. Um, I may have, I forgot. I don't remember. Uh, I don't know if, uh, uh, Faye, if she was, she took my class in the world. I don't know if I did that at, at, in that class or not, but I always just remember I hated doing it because it always not go as well as I expected it to go. Mm. But yeah, that was it. Google Earth, um, turn the lights off, you know, just put on some YouTube videos, show some pictures, move around on Google Earth. But it never felt like, wow, that was so cool. Like, it just like, I was like, ah, I don't think it worked. <laughs> yeah, for me, and this is super random. So for Ma Mac Mappy Malcolm's Boston Project, I'm tracing Malcolm X's life in Boston from like 1941 and to 1953, and I'm looking at sites that are important to his political and religious development. And some of those include prisons, because he was arrested and incarcerated um, in the greater Boston area. And I don't know if this is just a general Google Maps policy, or if they have something against Boston, but you actually cannot get Google Map images of prisons and jails, probably for good reason, but <laughs> it's made it difficult for me and then so much of what I'm looking at is in black areas and Google does not always have the most updated information when it comes to like black areas or urban areas in general. So I'm trying to show how 
the buildings and sites looked when Malcolm X was alive and now what they look like today. And most of the images are like five or six years old. So you can't really get a true perspective of what's going on because I'm talking about gentrification and urban renewal and the buildings look so different. And I've noticed too that my students are not nearly as excited about a lot of the tech things as I am in class. Like it seems like sometimes they would just rather sit there and hear me talk for 75 minutes, but I don't like the sound of my own voice and I'm not that interesting. Like I want to hear what they're doing and I want them to experience, but they just have their own ideas about the world. So I, I'm pulling back on some of my digital tools. <laughs> so we, we all think you're fascinating and it, we love the tour <laughs> and uh, a plug, right? So at the, at the AAR uh, meeting that's coming up, Kayla will be also uh, guiding a virtual tour of, of uh, Malcolm's Boston. Mm -hmm. So we're excited to see that as well. Mm -hmm. all right. Can I add something, um, Can yeah, I add something please. from a student's perspective? Okay, so I took a course with you, Dr. Morales, and I'm thinking that it was Eastern religions. I'm not really sure. But I know that um, we did we did tours or when we you had us to present, and I don't know what program you used. I don't know if it was Google or something else, but it was fascinating to be able to just go to this place in the world, you know, and talk about the people and talk about the religion and actually show pictures and everything. It was really fascinating. Oh, I, I remember that, that, that was like my first year teaching at Morgan. Um, that was like, yeah, that was a while back. Um, yeah, and I, I, the assignment was, was very, yeah, straightforward. Go, go and, uh, and find a map located, find yeah. uh, some of the, the institution, some demographic information. But yeah, the, I think the goal was to, to in place religion so that it's not this um, disembodied um, set of like, um, beliefs uh, that exist somewhere out in the in the um, ether right but to like put it in a place and mm -hmm. and then think about the people that are there and the ways in which religion interact so that that was before I was even um, right looking at the murals and doing the the kind of archival and ethnographic um, research in, in terms of the relationship between the murals and the neighborhoods mm -hmm. but yeah thanks for reminding me of that so there's like an early foray into to making sure that we looked at um, the relationship between religion and place. It was a great way of learning, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's all I have. I don't know if anybody has any mm -hmm. other questions or things they want to share. Yeah, I was wondering what you awesome. guys think about the future too. <laughs> do you think, do you think like at all, you think like we'll keep a lot of this stuff? Cause it seems like it's like a fundamental shift happening. A lot of my students are like, I really like this, which was kind of interesting to me because at first I thought, oh, they're going to really want to go back to in-person. And But actually a lot of my students enjoy being in there. Like a lot of students are at home. A lot of students have been able to take on another job while they can go to school. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I have a colleague who also has um, related to me that they enjoy this, that yeah. They, they live close by to campus, but even that, whatever it is, 15 minute commute um, and getting out of the, finding a parking space and then walking over. So they, they just feel like they save a lot more time. And I think it's both like in terms of productivity, but then also the amount of time that they, they can give to their, their family, their kids, um, mm -hmm. and just be more present there for them. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't know, like in terms of the future, I think you're right. There are people who who see ben a lot of benefit. Um, I like the small group thing. I've never been able to have like very super um, like five person uh, small group discussions. And that's now possible through um, the, the tools of this, um, this way of organizing it. But I could also easily do that outside of um, the, the quarantining virtual space. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, because I was wondering, especially because I'm a small liberal arts school and uh, a lot of the students actually, and, you know, um, I guess Christina was talking about, she has like 187. I, you know, as small liberal arts, I don't know, I think Morgan State is kind of similar to us, um, you know, 20, 30 students. So, and yeah, I actually, yeah, 
it works virtually. I think it's much easier to have conversations virtually with like 20 yeah. to 30 and that kind of privileges smaller schools a little bit actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think also like I mentioned the IJB, the Imagining Justice in Baltimore series, um, has, it's been beneficial in terms of um, getting Morgan students access to those because transportation has been so prohibited, um, prohibitive. And, um, and I'm hoping that the, uh, the, cent the ICJS will continue to do some kind of a virtual format in the future. Um, but I, I also understand that there's great benefit to introducing people to these spaces that they otherwise wouldn't visit um, throughout the city. Mm -hmm. And that that might tie back into like the possibility of expanding the the space of the city onto the virtual um, mm -hmm. and whether or not that's possible. And yeah. to the extent that it's not, then we need to like get back in there. And to the extent that it is, then maybe we can figure out ways through social media, film, sound recordings to right. for, for more people to access the city. Yeah, and I wonder if the space of the city, the physical spaces might be ones more facilitated around intimacy, around privacy, around rather than like, you know, open, you know, kind of floor plans and designs because the virtual is allowing you to be public and open. The physical, you can be more private and intimate. And if cities might kind of change their architectural plans, because I was thinking about just like restaurants, yeah. for example, you know, like they're saying that a lot of restaurants are designing individual, you know, intimate spaces for one table with four walls, right? Yeah. As opposed to like a huge open restaurant. And I thought, oh, what about that in terms of like a university and a classroom? Like, what would that mean for the university and education? Like, should we be focusing on facilitating physically like an intimacy, a privacy, while allowing the virtual to serve as kind of the public? Yeah, no, that's interesting. Right. So like we also have um, a new set of parklets um, being opened up in Baltimore. Oh. Um, and so like thinking about the, the role that those are like outdoor um, spaces mm -hmm. that are mm -hmm. intimate. Um, right. And then the possibility of, of doing more of that in, on campus. So I, I, mm -hmm. I always, you know, mm -hmm. like I've, I've dreamed of taking students outside and doing classes outside and have never actually mm -hmm. done it. I don't know if anybody else has said maybe share. <laughs> He's doing that now. <laughs> yeah, I can't do that where I'm at because it starts snowing in like yeah. <laughs> end of September. Although, you know, it is very interesting because I did think about that too as the city. Will the city be more green? Because if you don't need all these roads and stuff, let's say if there's yeah. less commuting and stuff, can the city be like one of a lush garden and, and parks? And, you know, because I saw an article that park attendance for the national parks has gone up by like 400 percent or something like that because yeah. the national parks have the ability to facilitate a certain intimacy when you're in there you know you don't have to worry about being around you know th even though there are like five thousand yeah. people in there um you feel alone yeah yeah so i yeah i think that's a good question also in terms of like the campus itself so then what what does the campus become um within this kind of situation yeah mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I think it could be actually very interesting. Um, and I, I don't think it has to be one that's a lot of expense either. Like, you know, it doesn't have to, it should just be more around creating more gardens, creating more food. Cause like I was talking to students the other day and they've transformed the campus. They only come to the campus when they need food cause we have the, a food resource center. So I thought, oh my God, that could be an interesting, you know, yeah. they're only coming, you know, twice a week to pick up food from the food resource center and from the fresh gardens that we have. I thought that's an interesting way yeah. to kind of think about the campus. Awesome. This has been a, a great conversation. Uh, thank you everyone for joining. For more information about how you can get involved and make change in your community today, please visit the Contagion Religion and Cities webpage at religionandcities.org slash contagion dash podcast.